So welcome to our, this is our City of Trees second virtual event. Uh, I'm Shannon, I'm an assistant project officer. Carly that you can see there as well, she's our fundraising manager. And then Steve, I'll let him introduce himself shortly. He's the man you've all come to see. Uh, don't worry, this is all free. I've just mentioned fundraising, but it is all free. Uh, so just in case anyone doesn't know about City of Trees, just a little bit about us. So we're an environmental charity based in Salford with a focus on tree planting. So our aim is to plant 3 million trees, one for every person in Greater Manchester. And we're planting the Greater Manchester part of the Northern Forest which is a stretch of forest from Hull to Liverpool made up of 50 million trees. So overall those 50 million we planted in about 25 years. It's, it's a big job. Um, so within City of Trees, we've got a project called Woodland Futures. That's been running for two years so far. It was due to finish in September, but obviously because of COVID we've, we've uh, extended it. Not too sure when it's been extended till that's yet to be confirmed. Um, but it means we get to carry on some amazing work. So Woodland Futures is based in the Woodlands of Withenshaw, historic Woodlands of Withenshaw. So our main three are Ashwood, Sandylands and uh, the Brundrit, which is in Rogers Park, if anyone knows Withenshaw. And then we also have satellite woods that we work in. Um, Parkwood, Bigwood, Gorse Covert and Princess Spinney. And basically the reason we're in these woods is because they're sort of historic relics of the big old estate. So Dunham, Tatton, um, I wouldn't say ancient woodland, it's not quite that level, but old, very valuable. And also it's sort of reminiscent of when Withenshaw, the vision for Withenshaw is that it was to be a garden city. So it was sort of an escape from the very industrial landscape of central Manchester where people could, you know, have a, a green haven. Every new house came with a fruit tree in the garden. It was meant to be a, you know, self-sustaining community. Um, so it's just nice to have these little green patches amongst what is now quite a well-developed area. So we're going in, City of Trees are working with community groups, schools, and we've got different partners. So we're working with, you know, charities um, just to conserve and enhance these woodlands. We'll do woodland management, we'll do tree planting, um, we'll make physical long-term changes, like we'll install paths, putting in different entrances, just things like that. And so one of the sessions that we offer for Woodland Futures is masterclass events, which is what this is counted as. We had one a couple of weeks ago with Dave Winard. It was a foraging event. I don't know if anyone, any of our attendees today came to that. Um, just to introduce people to something that they might not normally get to experience, get to learn about, um, just a little something to spark your interest in a new topic. So that's... Uh, Woodland Futures, this is what this project, uh, this presentation is being delivered on behalf of. Uh, so Steve's kindly offered his services and his bat knowledge for the next hour or so. So this is gonna be about an hour's talk and then half an hour or so at the end for questions, depending on how much different people have to ask. Um, if you wanna pop any questions in the chat or the q and I will pick them up and ask Steve at the end because Steve you said yourself that there might be some questions that pop up along the way that you will answer in the next slide so it's always worth sort of doing it at the end just in case someone's question has been answered um, but I think that's all from me so Steve I'll hand you over okay thank you very much thank you and um, yeah and firstly just thanks for the invite to come and speak um, this evening I uh, I, I hope that this is an enjoyable and interesting talk for everyone that uh, attends. Um, uh, I've certainly done my best to try and make it so, and I hope that I convey some of the um, some of my wonder and amazement at that, um, and um, that I've gained over the years and, and still have really. Um, I find them fascinating uh, animals, and hope that this presentation sort of um, um, shows that. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of bats. Um, and hopefully lots and lots of interesting facts and figures and stuff. Uh, I'm a bit of a bat geek, I'm afraid. So, and I don't really have a stop button. So um, 
hopefully th there's going to be enough to keep everyone entertained for, for, the, for the, the next uh, hour or so. Um, and then I've probably got a bit of a bonus as well to share with you at the end, but I'll talk about that as we come to it later on. One thing that I should say very briefly is I will have to have a slight interruption um, at, my, at some point. My wife is due home from work and uh, the dog is going to go crazy. So um, I will just take a very a quick moment. We've got a plan that she rushes in as soon as she pulls up. So it hopefully won't, uh, won't, won't impinge too much on this. this part of the anyway, so um, as you know, my name is Steve Parker. I'm involved in these two groups, South Lanks Back Group, which is the local conservation group um, based around Greater Manchester and a little bit around the surrounding areas. So covering all the all the areas that uh, Sharon has just mentioned just now. Um, and we do an awful lot of work at some of the uh, the places that were also sort of slightly outside of traditionally South Lanks, places like Tatton Park, where we've had a, a long-standing relationship as well now. Um, I'm going to show you some bats actually, hopefully that I, I caught at Tatton as well during the presentation. I'm also involved in the Bat Conservation and Research Unit, which is a, a charity. We're based generally down in, in well, we do a lot of our um, survey work and courses down in, um, in in Sussex and we've done a couple in, in Jersey but some in Nottingham as well so um, but I'll touch on some of that as we probably go through the presentation but mainly I'm going to talk about self Lanks back group um, in relation to this but more important than that is the bats themselves that we're trying to conserve and, and what we do so I'll move on and uh, get some pictures of uh, some more bats up to show you well I will if I can press the right button hold on <laughs> There we go. Okay, so bats are our only flying mammal. Okay, uh, that's what makes them distinct. They inhabit all areas of the globe except for uh, Antarctica. They are found just inside the Arctic Circle, um, and just in the northern tips of Norway and the like, um, and even in Siberia. But obviously, the, the, the more um, to the real cold polar extremes, then uh, we don't get any at that point. And like most mammals and most animals, in fact, the closer that we get to the equator, the more species that we get. One of the best ways of sort of splitting the bats up is looking at some of the things that they eat. And you'll um, see lots of pictures this evening, I hope, of the different um, foods that they eat worldwide. All British bats feed on insects. In fact, most European bats do. There's one in Europe, which is the um, Egyptian fruit bat, which is found in Cyprus in very small numbers, which is the only fruit bat that we have in the European area. But everything else is insectivorous. But worldwide, we find bats like the fruit bat that you can see on the left hand side, definitely been on a mango. Um, we've got the one in the top left, which I have to put in. I've got a whole little section to discuss on vampire bats because they are fascinating animals um, and, and really not worthy of some of the reputation that they might have. And then a very, very important type of food uh, that that's feed on is, is nectar and the byproduct of that is really important for humans as well. So, and, and the planet as a whole, in fact. So I'm gonna cover all those sorts of things today. There are many different species, as I've just said. And uh, when I first got involved in conservation 20 odd years ago, um, there were around about 1100 species known. Um, that's what it said in all the books anyway. We found a lot more out. As technology advances, we've been able to understand much more about the species of bats that we have worldwide, and they are one of the most diverse groups of animals. They're not rodents, they are their own group called the Pyroptera, which means hand wing. So literally they use their hand as a wing to be able to fly. Um, and there are now just over 1400 species. Um, that was a count from I think August last this year rather. Um, and a lot of these are examples, we already have these specimens and they're, they're, they're stashed away in museum um, um, uh, collections. Um, and as w uh, technology improves, as I mentioned, we've been able to look at the DNA and understand actually these are different species and they're probably not what they've been labeled as. But also we have scientists going out in the field and catching that and finding them as well. Um, in some cases not finding them, which I'll come to later. UK wise, we've got 17 resident species um, that are known to breed here in the UK. Um, and there is one individual of another species which was actually declared extinct in, I think it was around 1992. The last mammals become, have been classified as extinct from the UK. We have one individual left, and I'll, I've got a picture of that species later on. Not the individual, but uh, the species, so I'll, I'll show you that in a bit. Locally, Greater Manchester wise, we have fewer again, so just 10 species. It's about 10, I should say. Now, actually, officially, at the moment, it's nine. But I was given some records about two months ago. I haven't seen the full information yet, but um, I believe it's our 10th species. And um, 
it's quite exciting but i'm not going to reveal it here today because I, I don't have the evidence to back it up yet so as soon as i've got that then uh, we'll be uh, we'll be very keen uh, on, on letting people know and that probably works in facebook group anyway um that's themselves. We know they've been around for at least 50 million years. Um, they probably saw out the end of the dinosaurs. They, and they were, uh, at least for the 50 million years, they've been in the present form as well. So you can see from this fossilized individual, you can see that um, the, the wings are fully formed. And we can tell you from x-raying the skeletons within the fossils as well, that they even had ears which are um, um, which show that they were able to echolocate. Now, the problem with finding many fossils is that they're very, very small and very, very delicate. So this particular bat, I don't know if you can see it, I've got a cast of it here. Um, so it might be a bit small on my picture because I guess the slide's covering most of the screen. But you can see the size of it compared to my hand. It's really quite small and these bones are very, very fragile and they don't really preserve very well in the fossil record. We don't have many uh, good examples of fossil bats. So we only get bits of bits of that. So we, we don't know a lot about the evolution of them. There's lots of theories around it, but, um, but in essence, um, um, we, we, there's, a, there's a lot of missing links, like, like a lot of animals. We do know that they've been around a long time, and we expect that they probably evolved from some form of tree living, tree, tree living even, uh, insect, insectivore, um, like uh, this flying squirrel. And this, this animal would jump from tree to tree and glide between the trees. And of course, the benefit of this, right, because it's got this um, flap of skin between the, the, four, the four limbs um, here and, and obviously the back limbs, the hind feet, and it allows it to glide and therefore it never needs to go on the ground. And by doing so, it can escape predators. It doesn't need to land on the ground, it avoids the terrestrial predators. And of course, it would only be a relatively short step, we think, from evolutionary terms to, to move from gliding sort of animal to sort of more powered flight. Um, and of course, then you don't even need to be under trees. You can exploit the air where there's really nothing else feeding at that time of night. So uh, when, when, when bats are trying to catch their food or what have you. Um, so um, they're free, well, reducing the risk of being eaten. So it's a really good evolutionary benefit. And it allows you to be able to feed on insects that other animals wouldn't be able to feed on as well. And to be able to then move large distances too, as we will uh, we'll find out. I've mentioned flight already, and I just want to point out some of the flight methods uh, mechanisms in this um, uh, picture. So you can see here that I've said that the, uh, uh, before the bats belong to their own group called the chiroptera or the hand wing. Okay, so you have to use a bit of imagination, but I'm just going to demonstrate on this bat's wing. So you can see this joint here. This is the bat's elbow, and from the elbow, we've got the upper arm that joins its body, and then you've got the forearm here, which results ends in the wrist, just like us. You've then got a little claw, which is the bat's thumb. And then along, along the edge of the wing, you've got the index finger and the middle finger. This is the ring finger, if you like. And then this one is the, the bat's little finger, but obviously in bats, they're really long, much elongated. So in effect, the bat is holding its arm just like I am now. It probably doesn't show up too brilliantly. Um, but in effect, they, they're using their hands to fly. And the other adaptation that they've got is to, to be able to echolocate. And this is our insectivorous. And the way they do this, or the way that I explain it, is it's like us. When we're trying to find our way around at night, dark, we might bump into stuff unless we've got a torch or a light. And if we use the torch, what the torch does is we shine out a light in a beam. A lot of that light then hits things and it reflects back. And our eye collects that reflected light, sends a picture to the, sends the signal to our brain, which interprets it into a picture of our surroundings. And that's very similar to what bats do, except rather than using light, bats use sound. And they don't use an artificial thing. They wouldn't be using a tape recorder. Look how old I am, a tape recorder, um, an MP3 player rather. Um, and they wouldn't be playing out a the sound. They're actually shouting out the sounds themselves, shout these high pitched sounds way above the human hearing range. And you can see the, the solid lines that this bat is shouting. And most of those lines are going to they're hitting this uh, this branch with a little insect cricket maybe on top of the branch all this sound here at the top would just go off into the distance it wouldn't hit anything there'd be nothing reflected there so it would know there's nothing there whereas lower down the reflected sound is these dash lines which are going back to the bat's ears which are pointing forward to collect it and then they send a signal to the brain which converts into a picture of its surroundings it's as good as our sight sometimes even better um, and some bats can even tell the thickness of a human hair so it's really really quite detailed and this map will be using its echolocation to find that insect 
to go and glean it. So in other words, to scrape it off the surface of the, the branch in this case, okay, which is one of their feeding methods. And this is a natteras bat, okay? Other bats feed in different ways. This is a horseshoe bat, um, again, resident from the UK. Um, they've got a little horseshoe shaped nose. You might be able to just make it out on the picture there. Um, and they tend to wrap their wings around and their tail around when they're catching an insect. Um, just, and they can use it almost like a baseball glove if they miss it and catch it in their mouth, uh, which is their preferred choice. Um, and this one's trying to feed on a moth. And the way that they do this is that their echolocation calls, their, their, the sound that they make is so detailed that they can work out exactly which way the moth's wings are facing on each flap of its wing beat. And rather than chase the moth, they plan an interception route for it, go and cut it off, catch it, take it back to a roost, a perch maybe like on a branch, and they'll hang there and eat it. And you get a little pile of moth wings underneath it and bat droppings. So, um, um, uh, you know, it's called perch, perch feeding that they use. Okay, so there's a different method that they, they use for that one. Okay. Um, this echolocation noise that the bats make is really, really high pitched. I'm going to try and play you some sounds. Okay. Now, I'm aware that when I do this, I'll have to be quiet for a moment so that the, um, the microphone picks up the electronic sound. So I'll play a couple of them. There's three different sounds, but hopefully you'll be able to hear these and the differences between them. And the reason that I've, um, I've got these recordings is because we use a bat detector which can convert it to something that we can hear. As I mentioned before, it's too high pitched, it's way above the human hearing range normally, but for, we use these things which can then allow us to hear them. So here we go. Just to ask Carly to nod her head to see if, I, if that, you could hear that okay. Excellent, okay. <laughs> so I wasn't sure if that was going to work, but it's really nice to be able to hear the sounds because they're so different and distinct. And this is one of the ways that we find our way to find the different species. That's hibernate during the winter. And then after the winter, they come out uh, and start to regain, feed a lot to put on the, the, the weight that they've lost and the food reserves and build up the energy again for the summer. The females also, um, fertilize uh, the egg. They mate in the autumn, which I'll come to, um, but they fertilize the egg in spring and then they uh, form around about mid-May these maternity colonies. And the maternity colonies are very warm roosts where the, the females gather to give birth to the young. And you can see over here just near the rafter in this roof that there's a little baby bat just here. And there's a couple of other ones. I'll point down to the one right at the bottom there. There's a mum bat, a female bat here with its little baby attached feeding on milk. So they're mammals, so they all feed on milk from their mum. They need to be in a warm roost, so that, because like all um, baby mammals, they can't regulate their temperature. And also the, the warm um, temperatures allow them to digest the milk. Um, and when they're born, they are rather large. Okay, so you've got an x-ray of a pregnant bat here. And just to illustrate it, just to say how big they are, they're a third of the adult size when they're born. Okay, they only generally have one baby, but uh, in human terms, this is massive. It's like um, um, uh, a nine stone lady begin, giving birth to a three stone baby, which is, is huge. Now, obviously bats have to be adapted to be able to give birth to something so big. But one of the reasons that they're so large is because they need to feed very, very quickly and um, get to full size quickly and then learn about the world in time for the hibernation period that's coming up at the end of that year. Okay. Now, when we say a third of the adult size, you think, oh, this is massive. Well, there's a real bat, a real baby bat. This is one I rescued a few years ago. Um, I can't remember when now. Um, but this is a baby pipistrelle bat, which is the common, most common species that you're likely to see. Um, and you can see just in relation to the size of the pen there that it's uh, around, well, it fit on top of a pound coin. It's absolutely tiny. And this one's around about three days. Four, six weeks of feeding on its mum's milk, you can hardly tell the difference. Now, you might tell that these have changed species. These are Dorbenson's bats, sometimes known as the water bat because they love feeding over water like canals and lakes and rivers. And 
And I'll just point out the, the, the youngsters. It's this row at the top, this one here, this one here, this one here, and these ones. And I can tell that because their fur is a slightly, it's not quite as richy red color as the adults, which are just over on this side here. But for all intents and purposes, they're fully grown and they're going to be out feeding and their mum will teach them how to feed um, and, and fly. And then around about August time, these maternity colonies that I mentioned will start to break down and um, we'll get again into the mating season. There's different ways that bats mate and sort of, sort of do their courtship. Um, one way that male bats might locate themselves in a tree um, or in a house or a building, and they will sing. They do these, these calls, they'll fly up and down outside the, uh, the roost that they found and defend it from others, and, um, and hopefully attract some females to mate with. And then there are other places that they go, which are, um, we know them as autumn, say autumn swarming sites. And these tend to be underground sites like caves and mines, where bats move to. Now we don't really know if they're using them for mating or whether they're actually taking their young there to show them where to where to hibernate because often these sites are hibernation sites as I mentioned. Oh excuse me one moment. I did say this would happen. What zoom call without a uh, without a dog interruption. There we go. I'm back. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I was just talking about the swarming sites and uh, moving on to, um, to um, hibernation as well. And the, the fewer insects that are available in the winter, bats do hibernate. And they tend to choose places which are, well, often underground, but they'll also use trees as well. But they need, the, the most important thing is the, um, the features that the, the site has got. So they need to be cool. They need to be humid, so they need lots of moisture in the air, and also they need to be stable. That's more important than the, than the others. Um, so, but ideally all three. And what happens is that um, you get this this particular bat is just hanging out in the open. It's a whiskered bat. It's brown in colour normally, but it looks silvery and grey like this because it's got little droplets of water that have condensed all over its back. We call it a frosted appearance. Other bats in hibernation, they ram themselves into cracks. These are the fun ones because they're, they're actually quite difficult to see sometimes. You might just see the tip of an ear and a bit of fur or a bit of nose and the, the, the thumb um, on the wing or the end of it, or sometimes even a couple of toes and that's it. We're meant to try and identify these bats from it because we go into these sites over the winter to count them to monitor how our populations are doing. Um, we also get the horseshoe bats. I mentioned horseshoes earlier. This is a lesser horseshoe um, in, in a site in North Wales. And uh, these horseshoe bats are about the size of a thumb, absolutely tiny, okay? And they sometimes hang in clusters from the ceiling. So we get large clusters like this. This was about 220, I think, in this cluster. Um, and often we take, rather than sit there and try and count them all, we'll often quickly take a picture, go home, put it on the computer, and then do a little paint blob on each nose and, and count them all off. So, uh, so it's easier to do. But this is nothing. I mean, this is what this is the, ma the most we'd probably see in a cluster in the UK. Um, but so when we go overseas onto the continental Europe, then we might start to see clusters like this. And this is one that I saw in Poland. Um, and it's not uncommon to find 100, 150, sometimes up to 200 bats in a, in a cluster there in one of the sites that we look at. But just recently, in one of the biggest sites, um, it's been found for hibernation in, um, in Romania. And I forget the exact number, I, could, I think it was around 40 to 50,000 individual bats all clustered up together like this. And in effect, they'd be carpeting a whole area of ceiling. Now, that's again, even that's quite small. When we move over to, uh, to, to the, um, America, uh, America rather, um, then there are records of bats in the hundreds of thousands, even up to the millions, sort of hibernating in sites um, like that. So really quite, quite amazing. And they cluster like this to, to keep the temperatures relatively stable. There's a different way that bats, some bats um, manage with the lack of food over the winter. And this little chap is an Ephusius pipistrelle. This is one that I did catch at Tatton Park actually. Um, and we've been part of a project since 2014 looking at these. This species was thought to be a vagrant species until I think uh, even into the mid nineties um, in the UK. Um, but actually, particularly since this project that started six years ago, um, we found an awful lot out about this particular bat. We know that they migrate. Um, we 
recently had the longest record found of a migration, which is from the Latvian coast, where some scientists put some traps and they catch bats that are migrating heading south. And they always seem to head in this sort of um, southwest direction, northeast, southwest uh, sort of uh, movement pattern that they have. Um, and there's, this is the longest recorded migration of any known Nathusius pippus trout, it's called, um, since, well, since records began. Um, so really quite a, a massive difference. And this is a bat that is tiny. It weighs about eight to 10 grams, okay? And just to put that in some context, our common pippus trout, this isn't a common pip actually, it's a soprano, but this bat weighs the same as one of these, two P coin, and if that's showing up as well, okay? Around about five grams, it would fit in a matchbox, okay? Absolutely tiny. So I mentioned um, our pipistrel bats. Um, so we've got three species, the Nathusius, this is the soprano pipistrel, and we also have the common pip. But the soprano was um, separated from the common only in 1992, I think, no, sorry, 1994, I think it was, by a team at Bristol University. So fascinating study that we always thought we had one species of pip. So turns out we've got, well, these were actually two. Um, and it was these um, advances in DNA that I mentioned uh, that, that started um, uh, to differentiate between the different species. So um, overnight, we get a new species. That's great news. But unfortunately, we also get fewer of them. So um, that's not so great news. Um, um, but uh, we, we find common and soprano pipistrels all over the place. Sopranos really love water bodies as well. They always have them. We move from one of our commonest species in the UK to one of our rarest. This is the barbastel bat. Um, they're, they're quite flat based, but they're amazing little bats. I love them. They're, they're jet black fur with golden tips, really long um, sort of shaggy fur as well. And they're really nice and calm as well in the hand when we, when we deal with them. Really very rare and associated with old oak woodland. So it just shows the importance of woodland to them. Um, there are other bats like the Bextine bats, which are virtually entirely reliant on oak woodland. And usually they need a dense understory as well. Um, so it's very important to, to have good, good quality woodland for these bats to, to, to thrive. And, in, and often, in fact, we don't have that and they don't. Greater Manchester at the moment is fairly lacking uh, or we've got little fragments of woodland around the place. So uh, it's quite exciting to hear some of the things that are going on with uh, the city of trees. Another fairly woodland bat is the Alcophobes bat. Um, and this is our newest species in the UK. Um, well, newest resident species, I should say. It was only discovered to science in 2001, and then we found it in the UK in 2011. And uh, my project that we're working on with that crew, uh, Bat Conservation Research Unit, uh, we find these quite a lot uh, down in Sussex and Surrey, uh, where we, we base a lot of the survey work that we do. Um, we're involved in a project locally to try and hopefully find these as well, but uh, no, no joy yet. Um, they're, they're three very similar species, and uh, we've got two of them, but not that one. And these bats, we've got one of our most common bats on the right, which is the brown long-eared bat, and on the left, grey long-eared bat, which is one of our rarest. I think there's only three, three or five known maternity colonies in the entire UK of the grey long-eared. So really very, very rare. And there's been some big studies um, working on that uh, over the last few years. And um, currently involved in a project called the Back from the Brink project that the Bat Conservation Trust are leading on as well. Okay. So this sort of habitat is a great sort of habitat for bats. So this is exactly what we love to see. Um, and just to describe some of the places that bats would feed and find, uh, uh, fly, you'd have um, horseshoe bats sort of fairly low down in a, just around the edges of the foliage and under amongst the trees and everything. Um, right about sort of, um, well, head height and a little bit higher in the, in the leaves and amongst the branches, you'd get bats like the natural bat that I showed you before and the brown long eared bat that we've just seen. Um, you get down this ride here, um, another bat that loves these sort of uh, rides between trees is the barbastel bat, um, loves commuting along them. In fact, a lot of bats do that, but barbastels are particularly known for it. Around the tops and the edges of the trees, you'll get bats like the pipistrelle and the serotine bat, and then way up in the open above that, you'll get the lizards and the noctual bats. So a woodland like this has lots of different habitat types within it that can be exploited and used by bats to find their insect prey. And the more diverse the woodland, of course, the even better from, an, uh, from a bat's point of view. The contrary to that is something a little bit like this. And unfortunately, this landscape is not great. It's, um, it's pretty much, well, monocultures or very few different species of, um, of plants that are here. There's a good chance that there's insecticide or pesticides being used. There's not a lot of trees around. There's not even a lot of buildings around. So there's not a lot of places for bats to live and roost in, and there's not a lot for them to eat. So very few uh, bats are likely to be around. 
<coughs> excuse me, one of the um, um, uh, prey species for horseshoe bats are these uh, chafer beetles. And one of the things that um, is very important about the production of these is um, is the way that um, agriculture um, sort of um, um, uh, treats cattle in particular. And um, in a very, I'll keep it very fairly basic, but in essence, um, agricultural practices for years have, have uh, used uh, certain medicines on cattle, um, which mean that the dung that they produce is pretty much sterile. It, there's not a lot of uh, insect life that can live in it. Um, and these um, these beetles will um, thrive in uh, very sterile, uh, sorry, um, um, very organic uh, dung, which is full of nutrients for that they can they can feed on. Um, and these are very important food sources for certain bats at particular times of year, particularly the horseshoe bats. So it's very important that um, farming practices um, from a bat's point of view for conservation are um, sort of improved to um, to ensure that we've got you know healthy populations of bats. If this is the only food that these bats have got, then it makes big big impacts if there's a if there's a problem. And one of the impacts that we've seen over the last hundred years or so are reductions, estimated reductions of the horse, greater horseshoe bat from sort of a hundred odd thousand individuals around about hundred years ago to around about well, even uh, 10,000 individuals about 20 to 40 years ago. Now, things are starting to improve because we've learned a lot about them. There's some studies that are ongoing in the UK which have shown how important uh, cattle farming practices are for these bats. Um, and then steps have been taken to improve for, for them as well. And uh, it's, it's really, we're starting to see the impacts of that now as well. Another impact to bats, you think trees, great, fantastic, really useful for bats, as I've mentioned. Uh, maybe not so much uh, this sort of monoculture crop again, this plantation woodland. Um, a lot of light doesn't get down to the ground, so you don't get a good insect, uh, diversity of plant flora, um, and then for, you don't get the insect um, diversity as well, so there's not a lot for bats to feed on. One thing that is quite good for, though, is um, um, natura's bats. They will feed on spiders, and this habitat can be pretty good for those. Um, but um, from a diverse point of view, it's not very good. There's a lot of threats to bats. Um, one that's happening in America at the moment and has been for a good number of years is this thing called white nose syndrome, which is a fungus that almost certainly came across from Europe or potentially Asia, but more likely Europe. European bats don't seem to have any problem with it, but um, in America they, they, they do. It seems that it irritates the skin. It uh, sort of covers the, you can see on the nose is there, but it covers also um, wing membranes. And it seems to rouse these bats out of hibernation. Now, the problem with that is that when you've got food reserves and nothing to feed on, your food reserves very quickly are used up um, and you can't replace them. So bats are dying and there's mass, mass mortality been found in some sites in America. Um, and even numbers suggest you know, um, millions, seven to eight million bats and potentially for some species, it might lead to extinction in 20 years. Major, major threat. Why is that important? Well, bats eat lots of insects. They eat insects of crops, crops that are very important for us. Things like in America in particular, where these figures come from, somebody calculated the impact to the environment in financial terms. And that's led to a lot of money being thrown at this to research the impact um, of white nose syndrome and also to try and find some ways of dealing with it. Because bats will save the economy, this is in America, of course, um, billions of dollars. And this is because they, instead of um, treating crops with insecticide and pesticide, bats will eat a lot of these pests, things like corn earworm, uh, which is a corn crop pest, um, a cucumber moth, and uh, even the moth that, um, that that feed on cotton. These are massive industries in the in, in northern uh, United States. And of course, then the problem with using insecticide and pesticide is, of course, you've got the associated pollution that goes with that as well. So there's a huge saving to be made that bats already give us, and it's what we call we term an ecosystem service, and it's a really important phrase. Um, so. Yeah, they, they make big savings of money, but they also contribute to the economy in different ways, as we'll find out. We get a lot from that. Okay. Other impact from, um, from um, um, human practices on bats are these things, uh, wind turbines, often found um, sort of on migration routes. And again, some figures from the States suggest that um, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of bats that get impacted by these. And these are bats which can be either hit directly by the turbine blades or we know now that there's um, a, a, something called barometric pressure um, impacts where, well, it's not very nice to talk about, but basically um, there's, there's differences in pressure around the blades and basically the bat's insides explode. Um, it causes massive trauma to them, of course, and, and uh, they, they 
they don't often survive that. They may be able to fly a bit further before they succumb, but uh, um, yeah, not, not, not good impacts. Why is it important? Well, this individual bat, well, this isn't the bat, but this is the one I mentioned before, which was declared extinct from the UK in 92. Um, it's the greater mouse ear bat. We still find it in the continent, um, quite numerous in the continent, but in the UK, there's just one individual. In fact, that was uh, you know, found in 2003, ringed as a juvenile. It's been found in its site every winter in Sussex, except for this year. So 2020, earlier this year, it was not found. So we don't know if it's back to zero or whether it just missed a year. They do do that. So, um, but they, they tend to be fairly faithful. This is the real impact of it. Shocking to think that for a, a, probably a good number of us on the call that a, a, a mammal has been declared extinct from the UK. But it's not just in the UK, worldwide, um, the, the, the IUCN red list has a number of bats on it, and I believe in the top 10. And you look at the numbers that are left here, less than 100, 150 bats. Um, you know, frightening numbers. Things like the Shell, Seychelles sheath tail bat. If we have a cyclone um, that hits the Seychelles, potentially that could wipe out the remaining population. That, that's, that's how serious it is. I was lucky enough to be able to go to a conference in, I think it's 2010 over in Croatia, which was the International Bat Research Conference, which was a great conference, fascinating. But at the end of the, the, um, the week, there was an IUCN meeting um, and the guys who used the red list I've just mentioned. And unfortunately, an expedition to the Christmas, Christmas Island to try and find the pipistrelle had failed. And at that meeting, it put a bit of a downer on the entire conference, but it just brings it home how real this thing is. The Christmas Island Pipistrelle was declared extinct right at the end of that conference. And it was really a, it's a shame, so it was a great conference otherwise. And again, this is, this is really happening right now. Anyway, a bit more numerous around bats. Um, some bats are doing quite well uh, in Australia. Uh, we find things like the great headed flying fox, really quite numerous, and we can, we can see them here. They are still protected species, I believe, in Australia. Um, they can be quite noisy at times as well. This was a picture was taken by a friend of mine. She was um, uh, over in uh, Australia at the end of last year. And um, a bit of a close up. This is a different species, but just to show you some of the, the different faces that we have. This is um, Lyle's flying fox from Thailand. I took this when I traveled there a good few years ago. Um, and this was a camp of around about 5,000 bats. Amazing to watch at sunset as they all flew out from the, um, from the trees that they were living in to go and feed of an evening. Um, it's all, all the more amazing because it was right next to a monastery. So we had monks chanting and then these bats flew out. It was just really quite an atmospheric evening. Fabulous night. Tend not to show too many pictures of people handling bats without wearing gloves. But um, the one at the top is not is a picture that I've lifted. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's a well-known picture just to show the size of these bats and how big fruit bats can actually get. Um, and uh, they've got a wingspan, which is basically just short of six feet. Um, so massive, massive wingspan. It's not a great way to hold a bat either. And the bat in the bottom is a picture of the bat which, um, well, I held back in, that was again in Thailand. That's the smallest species known. And it's actually the smallest, um, I believe it's the smallest mammal worldwide. Um, and this is Kitty's hognose bat, or sometimes known as the bumblebee bat. And that just describes the, the size of it. I found it quite difficult to handle with gloves because, um, well, basically they're so fragile that they, uh, yeah, you just don't want to break them. And it was, you know, they're really, they're really quite fragile and not that easy to handle, I found. Anyway, um, but really, really tiny. Some of the adaptations that bats have, um, the brown long-eared bat, um, massive ears for a start. It's sometimes known as the whispering bat. So when I mentioned before about the echolocation, I said they shout out this high-pitched sound. This thing doesn't need to shout, it can whisper. And in fact, there's an amazing thing that's going on with uh, brown long-eared bats. The food that they prey on, moths um, in particular, um, have evolved over time a simple ear. They can hear the bat's echolocation calls. When they hear it, they drop out of the sky, land on a leaf and wait. The bat stops echolocating, but these bats hearing is so amazing that they don't actually have to echolocate to find their insect prey. They can hear the footsteps of it or the wing beats as the moth starts to move. So they do this thing called passive listening. So they, they stop echolocating, the moth thinks the coast is clear, starts to move, not clear, not clear, the bat moves in and grabs it, of course. An amazing arms race evolutionary. Um, there's even bats that can jam, uh, sorry, insects that can jam the, the sound that bats make now, um, as well that we found out. Be interesting to see where this moves, but uh, probably won't be in my lifetime. Um, interesting fact, this picture I took was recently made into a stamp as well. So uh, I, I threw this in for our back group last week because I presented this to them. 
and uh, this is a stamp, it's actually in uh, Kazakhstan, I'm not sure I've said that right, but uh, um, somebody found the picture and uh, um, sort of sent it me and wanted to know the history of where, how the picture had uh, been taken and everything. It was actually one of our long-term captive bats from a good few years ago. Um, there we go. Moving on from the quietest bats to some of the loudest, the nocturnal bat, these shout at ridiculously high volumes. Um, it's a good job it's above the human hearing range. And these are above the legal limit of a nightclub. It's like being stood next to a jet engine. So when these things shout out these sounds, they're incredibly loud. They travel for long distances. We have bats which have amazing nose features. Okay, this is another um, bat from uh, Thailand. And all these folds around the nose are all about the way that the bat sends the sound out. So most bats shout it out. I showed you the horseshoe bat before. They show, send the, the sound rather out of their nose rather than their mouth. And all these flaps of skin direct where that sound goes. I've got some more pictures I'll show you in a moment of that. In fact, here we go. This one is another nose emitting um, or sound emitting bat, and this huge flap of skin over its nose, it's called, it's called a, um, a leaf nose bat, um, then this sends the sound out in the particular way. It's how this bat needs to, to it needs it to be sent out so that it reflects the sound in a particular way. And it's got these really massive ears, but some bizarre facial features that they have at the time, um, leading up to the, this one, which is the ring face bat really quite amazing and i think these are i personally i think these are stunning i was lucky enough to be in costa rica at the beginning of this year just before um the movement bands also that came into force and uh, we caught this one here and um, in fact we caught six or seven of these um, and they have these amazing folds of skin and um they're really quite unusual nobody really knows what they're for um it's thought that potentially it, it sort of channels the juice from the fruit that they eat away from uh, their eyes and their nose but and other bats don't have that, so why should these? It's really not known. They have some amazing other adaptations as well. These things hang up in fairly in the open in sort of um, well in bamboo uh, clusters, and they have a little pouch that they sort of it's on the neck and it comes over the head, and it's got these little translucent panels in. They've then got translucent panels in the wing, so they they put their little hood up. It's like a backwards hoodie. And then they wrap their wings around, and they've got these little translucent panels that they can see through just in case there's any danger. So they can then fly off at short notice if they see anything approaching. Amazing little adaptation. We've got bats like this one's Chapin's Chapin's free-tailed bat from Africa. Again, I've, I've been lucky enough to catch one of these. It was a real surprise. I didn't even realise they were in the area when we were there. And they use these little crests, and this is a male, which almost certainly uses its crest for mating. We couldn't get the male to put his, his crest up. Um, this isn't the bat that I saw. Um, again, I've uh, borrowed it from somebody else. But they also have some amazing other adaptations. This is a nectar feeding bat. So bats that stick their nose right to the bottom of the plant and they need these really long tongues to be able to get to the nectar right at the, at the bottom of the flower. There are bats that are different colors. So this bat is, uh, the reason that we, we, this one is a different color is because it mimics a butterfly. They roost in dead leaves and dead banana leaves, which tend to be orange. And this was in, this is in Thailand and you can find them in Burma as well. I believe, um, and uh, and across India, um, and this particular bat is that is known as the butterfly bat or the painted bat. And when it's disturbed, rather than um, sort of um, it, obviously they've got the camouflage uh, to rely on to begin with, because the banana leaves, uh, dead leaves, are tend to be fairly orangey brown. Um, but if they're disturbed, they will fly off straight away, and they fly usually in Thailand. They fly into the sugar cane, where it's not uh, it's not the most hospitable environment for other things to follow them. But they fly very differently. They fly like butterflies during the day, very sort of graceful sort of flight, very different to the way that they would fly at night from that. I mentioned earlier that most bats only give birth to one young. This is a really big constraint when they, we're talking about their population. So when there's impacts on bats, such as things like white nose syndrome, um, then if you only have, if the females only have one baby per year, it takes many, many years before that population recovers. Um, some bats, very rarely, will give back birth to uh, twins, but the the, um, the hoary bat in North America often will give back, uh, birth to more than one. This one's got three babies, so it does happen, um, but it's uh, and then they're usually successful as well. Um, but it's very rare to, to see more than one bat on any on any other uh, any any sorry more than one bat being born for any other species. This is another bat we caught in Costa Rica. It was on my lifetime list. Um, it was a, a definite bat I was desperate to see. I spent many nights sat by mist nets in the tropic, playing out calls of frogs. 
called the Tungara frog. Now this bat can tell which frogs are poisonous based on it, the call that the frogs make. So we've got some recordings and we've sat there with mist nets playing these calls from our phones trying to attract these bats. This place we didn't even need to bother. There were Tungara frogs all over the place and we caught quite a few of these bats. It was fantastic to see them. But just recently, even in the last few weeks, there's a paper come out saying that these bats will feed on other things like small lizards and um, even other bats and also in one case they found that they fed on a hummingbird which is a, a remarkable adaptation to be able to catch them at night so hummingbirds tend to be fairly immobile at night vampires then let's move on to vampires I've got a whole section on these um, this is a white winged vampire um, from trinidad um, wonderful little bats very placid very intelligent animals but they're amazing on that i could do a whole talk on these i'm not going to uh, promise but um they have heat sensors in their nose which um can tell the best places for them to go and feed um on an animal the common vampire will almost almost always feed on things like cattle maybe pigs or maybe a donkey uh, whereas the other two um the white winged vampire and the woolly, uh, hairy legged vampire will feed almost exclusively just on birds. They're only found in the uh, tropics, Central America and uh, Northern South America. Uh, so, um, again, Trinidad, uh, we found them in Costa Rica, Panama, um, and down into Brazil um, as well. So, they're a relatively small area. Um, these heat sensors find the best place for them to go and feed. They have remarkably sharp incisors and they make a small incision. Uh, on the animal, they lap up the blood. Okay, the bat, the animal hardly feels it because they have an anaesthetic in their saliva, and it's an anaesthetic that um, I believe we're trying to synthesize as well, um, using the chemical so that we can use them in operation in humans. But more importantly than that, they also have this uh, chemical in the saliva which is an anticoagulant, and that stops the blood from clotting, it keeps it flowing, and that can be very important to people who have blood clotting problems. My mum has um, a problem, for example. Um, and uh, she's on a, a, a medicine. This, uh, the medicine that's being developed from the chemical in bat saliva has got the best name. I'm, I love a, a pharmaceutical scientist with a, a sense of humor. They've called it Draculin. So um, really perfectly named um, on that one. And it's still in its uh, trials, but it looks far more effective than the, some of the best um, uh, clotting medicines that we have already. So it's really very useful to humans. They've got the most efficient kidneys in the mammal kingdom. They basically have to drink so much. Blood isn't the most nutritious food, okay? Um, so they have to, it's, there's a lot of uh, liquid in it. So basically, they eat so much that they're too heavy to fly off. So they, before they finish their food, they have to start, and they have to have a pee so they can fly. So uh, they've got these really efficient kidneys that process the food that they're eating and get the liquid that they don't need out of the system as quickly as possible. But even more amazing than that, these animals which are thought of as sometimes quite gruesome, exhibit this thing called reciprocal altruism. What does that mean in real terms? Basically, they look after each other. This can be unrelated animals. So it doesn't have to be um, mum and daughter or mum and son or, um, or, or, or any relatedness at all. They can just be two bats that hang up close to each other, um, but they, they build social bonds between them. Blood, as I've just mentioned, it's not the best food. It's not that nutritious. So if a bat goes out on its maybe its second night, it's not fed for the first night, it doesn't find any on the second night, then it's going to be in real problems. And what they do is maybe another one that's hung up next to it in the cave or the tree, they regurgitate some of the blood, stick it up for any youngers on, youngsters on the call, um, and basically it allows the other one to feed. Now, it doesn't sound the best, but it's, when it's life or death, you pretty much take any food, no matter where it comes from, um, and that will keep them alive. And the best thing is that they remember, and then they do it back when it's the other way around, when the roles are reversed, and they build up these social bonds between them. We've also just found out recently, there's a paper that's come out in the last week or two, which shows that bats, when they're ill, will distance themselves socially from each other as well. So, um, and it's been tested on, it's been from vampires, studied on vampire bats, and they will move away. When they're not so well, they'll move away from the, the main clusters are so that they don't pass it to each other. Um, something that we can uh, really be um, quite, quite thankful for at the moment and uh, obviously teach us a bit of a lesson. And um, I just chucked this one in because this is a bat that we caught in Panama. And I just thought the fur is just, I think it's a beautiful picture. This golden colored, this is a vampire bat. And it just shows those two incisors really quite nicely. It's taken by one of my friends who was on the trip. Oops. Anyway, moving on. I mentioned before, nectar, really important, really important. So this is a long, uh, lesser long-nosed bat. And they feed on these night, 
scented flowers. They open at night, they're pale colours, so the bats can see them quite well. And when this thing approaches, the, the nectar is right at the bottom, so it shoves its head right in, okay, right in. And when it does this, it gets absolutely covered in pollen. So you can see the colour of the bat going in, and it's this sort of colour, but whoops, where's my cursor gone? Up at the top. But all this stuff, all this whitish powder, yellowish powder, is the pollen from this plant that this bat is getting covered in. And what it's going to do is it's going to obviously feed on multiple plants that night and it's going to take the pollen from one plant to the next to the next to the next and it's going to pollinate all these different plants which then produces the fruits. And in some cases they are one of the key pollinators of certain species of and this is really important. They follow the food as well. This is down, um, um, this is actually Mexico. So this is the, um, 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 I can't remember what they call it now, fruiting trail or something. And the bats feed along this and they follow the food and uh, the fruiting plant, uh, the, the flowering plants uh, along here and pollinate in, in the main, the agave plant. And the reason that that's important is because we make from the fruit of the agave tequila, okay? And that is a multi-billion dollar industry in Mexico in particular. And uh, I imagine that there's quite a few people on the call that enjoy this occasion. They also spread seeds. So these bats are messy eaters. They will feed on fruit. This is a, a one eating the fig and it will usually go to a perch and it will hang up and it will eat the fruit. And there's loads of seeds in figs and it will spread the, drop them all over the place. And of course, it will then drop the ones that it's eaten when it's flying, when it uh, when it passes them out, when it does poo, and it comes out with its own little package of manure to help fertilize it as well. Some seeds, in fact, only germinate once they've been through the, the, the gutter of the bat, which is really quite fascinating. Um, and how important is it? Well, very important. This is a bat in Trinidad called the um, short-tailed fruit bat. If anyone's been to Chester Zoo, these are the little ones that fly around in the bat cave there. Um, and they feed on these piper fruits and loads and loads of seeds in here and these are seeds of a plant which is a pioneer so this is a site in trinidad where these bats are really quite um really quite numerous they're, they're um, probably one of the most um they're commonly encountered bats in trinidad and this is a site that was cleared for some work and some development site and three years later these bats have been passing and it looks like this and all these piper plant plantation these are the, the plants that start the regeneration of rainforest so really very very important these bats will cover um, um areas where, um um you know where, which have been cleared felled and they will spread the seeds a lot of other a lot of other animals won't because um, by um, covering clear area crossing clear areas they're at risk of predation so that's a really important there are bats that feed on fish. So this is the fishing bat with these massive claws that it can catch bats, uh, sorry, fish with from the surface of the water. They don't trawl for them and, and get and hope they get lucky. They know where these these fish are. When the fish come up to the surface, they'll touch the surface of the water, creating a little ripple. And the echolocation of these bats is so incredibly detailed that they can tell from the um, that the um, that the ripple which direction the fish is moving and where it's going. That it will then move in and catch these uh, these little fish to feed on. There are bats that roost in rolled up leaves. You can see these Spix's disc wing bats. Um, they have little suckers on the end of their um, end of their wrist here. They also have them on their ankles and they will roll up in little groups of four or five in these rolled up leaves. Um, unfortunately, the leaves unroll every, uh, you know, sort of over a few nights, so they have to find new roosts all the time. Um, but it's a really very great place for them to be able to hide and shelter during the day. Another way that they use leaves, this is in Costa Rica earlier this year. This is, um, this is a, a leaf that, that you can see some chew marks along the spine of the leaf. And if we move in closely, you can see just in the gaps in them, some little white fur here and a little yellow nose leaf as it's called. And if we then look underneath, it looks like this. And these are beautiful little tiny, um, little cotton wool type bats. They're, they're um, white in color. But the reason that they're white is because when the sun shines through the green leaf, they look green and therefore they become camouflaged. OK, um, in this case, I think there was a flash uh, when we used, took the photo. So they obviously appear white again. OK, so again, they can they can hide from predators, things like snakes and leaves are relatively flimsy so that uh, any heavy snake would just fall off. It. They wouldn't be able to move along it safely. They'll sometimes roost in massive numbers like this colony in uh, North America. This is in Bracken Cave, um, where there are estimated to be something like 20 million bats. And these are all babies that are born. They've got an individual call and an individual smell. So when their mums go out to feed, they come back to the general area where they left their baby and they'll pretty much find it every night because um, from the call and the smell of the individual bats, the sound again, really important to them. 
And when they come out, it's really quite a spectacle. Um, I've not been to see this one yet, but I have been to um, a place called Kasanka in um, Zambia. And every year, actually around about November, so around about now, um, there's a mass migration of bats coming down from the, the sort of the Congo jungle, um, the central um, um, rainforest belt in Africa. And they move down to South Africa, uh, to Zambia to be able to feed um, on uh, Winsberry. And one of the sites they go to is this one hectare patch of woodland. It's absolutely tiny and there's estimated to be something in the region of 11 to 12 million bats. I actually can't show you a photo that does it justice. Um, it's probably, it's my top wildlife site exciting ever. I've never seen anything like it and it's going to be a long time since anything comes close to touching this. But you, you, you have to imagine being completely surrounded by this. This is just in like in my field of vision, but of course it's all surround, surrounding us all over the place. And you know, so there are just millions of bats everywhere. Um, and it's, this is at, at sunrise, so the bats are coming back to the roost. You've got some mist there that you can see in the trees. Um, and we were in quite a high tower that the BBC used actually to film. Amazing place. Um, really quite fascinating and in fact with this one morning there was something obviously in the jungle uh, in the forest below them it kept disturbing them because they'd settled and then they'd all fly off again so we got treated to an even longer spectacle really quite something and you can see a lot of brown in the trees here it's, it's not branches it's, it's actually bats hanging off every available surface we were quite a distance away so these are the best photos that we can get but um really quite an amazing site and it's meant it's uh, supposed to be the biggest mammal migration on the uh, on the planet uh, again uh, bat related to put these numbers of millions into some sort of context these are the numbers of some of the biggest um, uh, roosts that are counted as part of the national bat monitoring program which we do here in the uk they're slightly different numbers there's no uh, <laughs> no millions in this lot I think the biggest roost is actually one of the rarest bats, which is the Greater Horseshoe there, a uh, site in Devon, 1800 individuals. So we've got this long running process where we go out and count these bats at sites as they fly out. So we, if you know of a roost, you can do this. It's really quite fun to do. You do a couple of nights in the summer, and then you put your information onto a, one of the Bat Conservation Trust's uh, web, uh, web pages. Very, very simple to do. Okay, and uh, we've been able to do those this year, even with the social distancing. So bats do bring us lots of benefits, as I've already mentioned. Um, I've talked about the ecosystem services. They don't, we don't need to use as many pesticides and insecticides because of them. Um, we get pollination from them. We get seed dispersal, which is great for rainforests and actually for our food as well. Some of the places that they live give us uh, lots of droppings, which can then be used, collected and sold as fertilizer, really quite important in some, uh, some areas of the planet. Um, in some places, unfortunately, they, uh, they do get used as protein as well, and uh, I'm not keen to necessarily uh, advocate this. Um, and um, I was once offered bats over in Borneo, but uh, I slightly declined on that one as well that I could. Um, but it can be sometimes for, um, for certain uh, uh, people in certain areas, such as in, uh, tribes in Guam, for example, where it's actually a very traditional uh, food that they use. Um, but some of the other benefits that we've had, I've mentioned some fruits already and, um, and, and the tequila there, but we get benefits, things like figs, um, mango, avocado, um, we've got cashew nuts there, uh, dates, bananas, really important for the pollination of bananas. Um, the plant that we make sisal from as well, so rope, as you can see on there, all sorts of fe uh, features. And of course, if anyone's traveled to Southeast Asia, then you'll know how important one of the fruits there is called the durian. Um, durian is a big, fairly big round fruit, it's fairly spiky, it's described as people by, uh, smells like hell, tastes like heaven, um, I must admit I did, wasn't particularly keen on the taste either when I was there, um, but, um, but it's again it's bat pollinated, really very very valuable and again another billion, billion dollar industry that, uh, that is um, reliant on, uh, on bats. So what can you do for bats? Okay. Well some of the things that you can do is you can garden for them. Bats um, rely on food, they like insects. So if you plant things which flower at night, uh, things like night scented stocks, jasmines, honeysuckles, um, uh, 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 evening primrose, sorry, I couldn't think, I had the picture of the flower in my head then, but I couldn't remember what it was called. Uh, or if you can put a pond in, um, these are really quite valuable, quite important, and they will bring in insects, which you, your bats will then feed on. Um, you can put up bat boxes. Um, this is uh, one of our trustees in the bat group. Uh, putting them up at a site in uh, Whitefield in Manchester and um, probably I think that box is still there. We occasionally check them, we've not been able to do it this year but um, most of the time we just leave them alone and let the bats use them 
as they see fit. And these are like artificial roosts. Um, with these, the, the hole is at the bottom there. So there's a bit of a gap just underneath where the bats land on this backboard and then crawl up into the space. And there's another bat box here, a different type, just behind Paul's, uh, Paul's arm. And uh, they, they do use them. So this is some nocturnal bats within one of the, the bat boxes that we've got in a roost up in uh, Chorley. Some people have got bats living in their houses. Now, if anyone on the call does, then if you have any questions or concerns, then uh, feel free to get in touch with the bat group afterwards. Um, I could answer questions on here potentially, but uh, you'll probably have more questions than we've got time for. Um, but uh, a lot of people actually get really protective over their bats after some really, well, sometimes some initial concerns. They tend to roost just up here, just in the cavity wall, actually, um, across Greater Manchester, almost all bat um, roosts that I go to are almost always pipistrelle bats and they're often in buildings of this sort of age and structure. They roost, they just nip underneath the, um, the, the white barge boards here, okay? And uh, go underneath a gap into the cavity wall where we find them. And most of the time they have absolutely no impact on the people who live there. In fact, the reason that this people, these people found out, this is a roost in Bury, the reason that they found out that they had a roost is because um, that baby had fallen out of it and they called me because they needed to, it rescued. And I went and put it back in and got it back to its mum and dad and was able to give them all the advice they need. They were really protective over their bats afterwards. Really enjoyable to them. We can do things like put rings on bats, as I showed before. And one of the benefits of those is when we turn up somewhere, then we can find out where they've been traveling. But also, more importantly, we can find out things like how long they live. And this is a Brant's bat, which is one of the oldest known living uh, species. And um, this, uh, not this bat, but the oldest one, which had a ring on it, was found to be 41 years old. And you think, you can see, this is my hand. It's a really small little animal. It's tiny. It's not no bigger than the, sort of just over the end of my thumb. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and yet they live that length of time, really quite incredible. Some of the research that we do, um, this is radio tracking. Um, the bat that um, I um, showed you before that we caught at Tatton Park, we did radio tag one there. And one of the benefits of being able to radio tag them, it, it is a little bit disturbing to the bat and a bit obtrusive, but what we're able to do by finding this, we chase it around the countryside. We start to understand how bats use the habitat. Where do we find them? Where are they feeding? Where do they spend their time? Where are they traveling? How are they getting from place to place? And very importantly, where are they living? Where's the roost? Or roosts in often, often cases, they, they'll move roosts as well, particularly those bats that like to use trees. And in fact, by doing that, we found one of the first um, known trees, tree roosts of Nathusius pipistrels in England. Um, so really quite an exciting time. And that was at Satin Park. So uh, the following day, um, a friend of mine found one in, uh, in Warwickshire as it happened, which was uh, really quite fascinating. But uh, we beat him to it, so uh, we, we often give him some uh, um, some dip for that. Anyway, um, but really quite exciting stuff that we can find out about the ways that bats move around the la landscape and where they're using. So you can do a few other things for bats as well if you want to get involved with them. Join your local group for people in the Greater Manchester area. That would be us. But there are groups across the UK, and I noticed that there's a lot of people on here from around the UK. Um, so someone was in Cheshire, I think, before I saw. So uh, there is a Cheshire back group. In fact, actually, a lot of Cheshire group uh, members are members of both ourselves, South Lancs and Cheshire. Um, um, and there's bit, there's groups across the UK. If you go onto the back group, uh, well, get it right, the Back to Conservation Trust website. And also join the Bat Conservation Trust, of course, as well. And that's very valuable because they're, they're our national voice for bats or even international one, whereas the local groups are just in the local area. So we're the ones that do the practical stuff on the you know, sort of local area and the surveys and the talks and the like, um, whereas the BCT work on a national scale and uh, hopefully uh, able to influence policy as well. So really quite important roles. But if you go onto the BCT's website, you can find your local Bat group. They've got a great section on there. Um, uh, which is uh, which will show you how to find how to find that. It's really very obvious. They also run a sunrise and sunset survey, and this has been brilliant this year. Loads of people have been taking part because you do a sur survey sounds really onerous, doesn't it? But lots of people every year do the bird one. They go out and they go the garden bird watch every sort of um, end of January every year, and they go and count the bats. That are, sorry, I'm obsessed. They go and count the birds that are in their garden and send in their records to. RSPV or BTO, one of the two, uh, not really into birds, uh, just bats. So um, we have our equivalent, which means that you go out and you stand in your garden, you can go to your local park. Most people will have bats in their garden this year. It's been really important, of course, because it's one of the nice things that people have been able to do is go and look at the wildlife. And it's one of the few mammals that you don't have to really um, 
travel far to see, you can see them very, very locally where you're based. So can't encourage people enough to take part in this. And then again, you go onto the Bat Conservation Trust website, very simple form that you fill in, just put your details in. Yes, I saw a bat. You don't even need to tell it what, tell what species it was, just I saw a bat is enough, or I saw five bats, even better, you know, if you're lucky enough to get that number in your local, local area. You can learn about bats as well. I'm hoping that we've done some of that this evening. I hope it's been really enjoyable, but also the websites I've just talked about um, the, the, the bat group ones and the bat conservation trust in particular, there's lots of fascinating information on there. I'm just talking to friends and colleagues and neighbors and family all about the real things around bats rather than some of the myths. I mentioned one of the big ones that we're doing around this year that we've had to work really hard about. And the bat conservation trust are involved in um, um, a project called Don't Blame Bats humans are passing this thing to each other, not, not bats. Um, if it came from a bat, it was probably just once, if it came from a bat. And the reason that I say that is because the, the virus is only 96% similar to the one that we're passing between each other. 96% um, is a massive difference, okay? Just to illustrate that, you can probably tell the difference between a human and a chimp. We don't look anything like each other, okay? 98% similar in the DNA. So it's actually a, a smaller difference than the, the two viruses, um, but bats seem to have been blamed quite unnecessarily for it. And even if they were the cause, ultimately they'd provide so many benefits to us, as I hope I've displayed this evening, that actually they're providing far more benefit. It's the way that we live which is causing the issues, unfortunately, and potentially why it's jumped from an animal species into humans in the first instance. So even just telling people about bats, learning about the real facts around them, um, and the other thing is to, you know, sometimes even lobby politicians. Now, this sounds a bit onerous, but just recently, the Bat Conservation Trust have emailed out to the Bat Group to say, look, we've got some concerns about this act that's coming forward that the that, um, government are proposing around planning. Would you send in your thoughts to, um, to your local MP? So they tell us what to say. We, they, you know, you can write your own letter as well, but they've given us samples and we can actually lobby our politicians. Very simple job to do. We've, um, all, well, I think many of the members in the back group have sent in letters to their local MP and they're taking notice of it, particularly if there's quite a few of you in your area. It's how we get change happening. And these are all things that you can do for that um, really quite easily as well. Okay. I thought I'd finish with a few, well, yeah, you, they are pretty beautiful, aren't they? Um, I don't use the word cute very often, but um, I can't think of a more apt word for it here. Um, so uh, just a, a few nice pictures of bats just to finish off. These are the gray-headed flying foxes, and these are orphan bats from Australia that were rescued every year, rehabilitated with the aim of getting them back into the wild. And a couple more, these are the spectacled flying foxes which uh, one of the places uh, looks after in, actually quite a few places look after in, in, in Australia. Of course, is, well, that's the end. Sorry, it's my it's attempt at humour. <laughs> and, uh, well, I'll laugh. Um, and uh, I'll just hand over for any questions at this point. So I think I've run pretty much to time. I said it'd be about an hour and we're pretty much bang on, I think. Yeah, spot on, <laughs> excellent. Okay. Thanks so much, Steve. My pleasure, my pleasure. Um, I hope it's been a, a job I've enjoyed giving the talk this evening. I've learned so much. <laughs> well, um, sorry, go on. I was going to say, do you want to do questions first or the bonus bit? Should we do some questions? Go for it. Go for Build the suspense and then do the bonus bit. Um, yes, yeah, so if anyone has any questions now, now is the time to put them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, we've had a couple that you've sort of covered, but we'll just go over them again because it might be worth reiterating. So Bob said, how long are bat wings? So what is the general wingspan? I assume very variable. So you said the largest is about six foot. But what about, say, the bumblebee bat? Would you know off the top of your head how yeah. big the wingspan would be? Yeah, I think they're around about five or six inches from what I remember. It's a few years since I went, I think 2011, but they're really quite tiny. Um, but uh, British bat species, the, most, the one that you'll almost certainly see, most people will be familiar with seeing the pipistrelle bat around their garden and around their street in the local park. And if anyone's ever been on a bat walk, almost certainly you will see, well, as long as the weather's good, <laughs> then you will see pipistrelle bats. But pipistrelle bats have a wingspan of around about that sort of distance. So um, around about seven, eight inches, something around about that sort of, that sort of length. Um, okay, I don't know why that is in new money, uh, but um, um, 
but yeah, they, they look sometimes a lot bigger and you get sort of the fisherman's tale about bats being from this big to that big and they're all pipistrels. And it's just simply because when they're flying around, they're very, very quick and uh, they've got this sort of figure of eight flight and they're very fast and sometimes quite jerky in the way that they fly as well. And for that reason, people struggle to see how big they are. Uh, they also have a tail membrane, which, you know, when the bat's about so big, when it, it sort of almost doubles the length of the animal as well. So yeah, quite... Uh, they look quite different but then the other bat the species that i'll compare it to is the nocturnal bat um mm -hmm. which has got a wingspan of around about 30 centimeters so about 12, 12 inches just over that um and uh, if you if you're really lucky just alluding to what the bonus might be you might get to see one of those shortly anyway um so yeah <laughs> so it is just very dependent on the species really how big the wingspan is yeah absolutely yeah and how close you are to them <laughs> yeah uh, Suzanne said she recently obtained a bat box. It's mounted to a local tree. How can they encourage a resident into it? So you mentioned, you know, growing jasmine, honeysuckle, putting a pond in if you have that resource. Just encouraging, yeah. is it more encouraging insects and the things that they would need into your garden? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing to do with bat boxes, um, I always suggest put them up. I guarantee that they will not use them if it sits in your shed or your garage. That, that sounds pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people have got bat boxes not doing anything. A lot of them won't be used. Um, we have to sort of understand that. I mean, even on our successful scheme, sometimes it's only 30 percent of the um, of, of the uh, boxes that we put up might be used. Um, and as I say, the really successful schemes for us. Um, the um, the best thing to do, put them up um, around about, usually we suggest something like three to five meters in height is ideal. Um, you, you need access underneath as well, bats drop out. And this is really the reason they're thought to hang, well, upside down, I think is the right way around to the bat. They hang upside down. All you've got to do really is open your wings, start flapping and let go with your feet and you're off. It's the perfect flight mechanism, but they also have to fly up to it to find it. So it's no good if there's lots and lots of branches there underneath it. That's quite important. Um, usually southwest facing is pretty decent as well. And often we'll suggest even putting up to three bat boxes on a tree. So that that's my southwest well, it's warm. Um, but also if we put three on a tree, then they can choose which one is the right conditions for them. You don't have to do that. You know, one is enough in most instances. Um, but then planting for them as well. There's many more different plants that you can uh, plant um, in your garden, which will attract in the insects that I mentioned. I just mentioned a few of them. Um, but if you go to, again, I'll point out there, I'm a big advocate for the Bat Conservation uh, Trust website, but there's a really good section on gardening for bats in there. Um, and it's got lots of ideas in there as well. Oh, amazing. <laughs> you actually just um, answered one of my questions because we've bought bat boxes for some of the woods in Withenshaw. Um, and I was going to say, is there a certain height? Because I know you mentioned that different bats like different environments and different, you know, open spaces, enclosed, etc. So yeah. that's really helpful. Yeah. Again, Bat Conservation Trust website, there's a good section on where to put a bat box as well. So oh, fantastic. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really handy. <laughs> so, I, used just... one of their trust, I used to be one of their trustees. I can't help but promote them. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Push the cause. But they're they, just they, um regular timber bat boxes they don't i assume they don't need anything special or fancy or no not necessarily um, no and potentially you know um after they've been up a year or so um, we might be able to come out and uh, check them for you if you are interested oh fab yeah that would be really good really good yeah stay in touch <laughs> oh, yeah acquire your services um danielle says when do bats start hibernating yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. And um, really, when it's cold enough, we think, um, or when it's not worth them trying to feed anymore. So they, they don't do a true hibernation like a lot of animals. They will rouse through the winter anyway. So like this evening, it's really quite mild where I am. Um, I was actually walking, walking the dog earlier and uh, without, didn't need a coat on or anything. Um, and I expect there will be bats flying and feeding this evening. And in fact, I was involved in some chat with some other rehabbers earlier today and they were saying yes we're getting we're still being able to release some bats because it's um it, it's warm enough for them to go out and feed um so we think also day length has something to do with it as well so the light levels and how long that lasts um, we don't really know the full triggers but basically there will become a time where a bat 
rouses itself out of its torpor, which is like a semi-hibernation state, and they use that during the day at this time of year to conserve energy. It's not worth them going out to feed because they can't feed on enough. And at that point in time, then they'll move into hibernation. We normally would start our first hibernation count first weekend in December, and then we go through to the first weekend in March. Um, this year it's all cancelled because again, of this risk of simply passing on a, an illness to them. So, uh, yeah. so yeah. We're, we're not doing that. So we don't want to be in enclosed spaces with them, generally speaking, unless we, we have to for the welfare of the animal. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, Di says, or D, sorry, do bats have loose joints? They seem to have their feet the wrong way around, especially when hanging up. Oh, brilliant. Well, well put. That's a great, great question. I'm pleased that you asked that one. Um, yeah, they've got a backwards knee, actually. So you're absolutely spot on, well spotted. Um, I don't think anyone's ever mentioned that to me before on any, all the talks I've done over the years. Um, so but they, they are backwards. And this is, well, basically they'd have to have incredibly strong legs to be able to stand upright so i mentioned one of the reasons that they hang upside down or our equivalent of it i always think of it being the right way around we often think about things in human terms we don't really talk about dogs being on all fours for example but they are um you know quadrupeds um but we just think that's natural for the dog it's the same for a bat their natural um, roosting position is hanging that way around um but they'd have to really have quite strong legs to be able to hang up as to be able to stand upright um, and to be to be able to to be um, um, uh, that that strong, they would be quite weighty. And of course, when you're flying, you don't really want to be weighty because you'd struggle to fly. So there's not much, there's, there's not many things like a, a fat bat <laughs> as such. Um, but that's that's the reason that they they are that way around. Also, when they when they flap their wings, it, now the way they do it, their, their elbows virtually meet behind their back as well. So of course, for us, that would be quite painful. Um, so there are sort of slight adaptations on the basic mammal form to be able to do what they, they need to do to be able to get around and, uh, and whatnot. But uh, yes, yeah, so they've got obviously the elongated finger bones and, and, and arm joints and things, and uh, the shoulders are much more flexible. But uh, they are, even the wings have muscles in the fibres of the wings, in the membrane. Really quite impressive. Oh, wow. So, Dee, that's a very good observation. If no one else has ever picked up on that. Uh, we had a comment from Nathan, Jacob and Rosie saying that they've, they're new bat enthusiasts, they've been to the, the bat cave at Chester Zoo. Um, nice. And they also said, why do bats have metal things on them? And I assume they mean the rings. Yeah, so those, those rings, they're rings that we put on. Um, to be able to study them. Uh, now you have to have a license, uh, and I think I might have just seen a, a, um, a question about protection, yes. which I guess is quite important, which would be good to come to. But um, you have to have a license to be able to put these rings on. So some of those, um, that's we are studying them. And some of the studies um, are based on us being able to identify that individual bat again. So if it turns up, so I showed the map before of this bat, which had traveled all the way from uh, Latvia down to Spain. Well, we've had some turn up in the UK as well from Latvia and next door in Lithuania. Um, and we had some from Holland as well. And I think one of our bats that was not, not mine, but another group from Northumberland, um, uh, Hazel, a friend of mine, um, that, um, that, that bat traveled over to Poland. It was found in Poland, but we only know that because we can identify them. And those little metal rings, they go, they go around their forearm and they don't close completely. There's a, there's a, like a, a gap, so it's a bit like a bracelet that it's got, but it doesn't close completely because the wing goes between the, the bits, like my, where my fingers are now, if you can see. And, um, and they slide up and they move a little bit up and down the forearm, not very much, but just enough so that the bat is comfortable. It's a bit like the bat wearing a bracelet, as I've seen. Um, but you have to have a license to be able to put them on to be able to study them like that. It, it, it can cause damage, so we take it very seriously when we put them on like that. Most of the time it doesn't, and it allows us to find some remarkable things like how old is the oldest bat, like 41 years, and also where they're travelling to and from. So it's really quite valuable. Yeah. That does lead really nicely into what Hannah said. Are all bat species protected? For example, if they're found on land, would these stop any building developments from happening? Okay. So all British bat species are protected by law, um, and that's under European law. Um, they're protected in, in England and in the UK anyway, rather, um, but also in Europe. So all European bat species are protected. 
worldwide though very few are um, um in fact some of the work we did in trinidad was to get them off the the, the permit list which was awful and now actually most of them are well they're off that um and most are actually the now protected people understand the value there so really quite important changes that have happened there um and um in in the uk though they are um they they can sometimes uh, cause delay to some development, but generally not. Now, unfortunately, what a lot of developers do is they tend to consider um, protected species a bit too late in the process, whereas if they started considering them right at the beginning, then it'd be a lot easier to deal with them. And those that do really don't suffer any problems with them sort of being found on sort of the development site itself. But the reason that they're, um, that they're protected is because they are still relatively rare. Now, whilst we might relatively easily see them, and that seems to be making a bit of a recovery, they are very few and far between compared to the traditional numbers that we should have in the UK. And this is why we need to protect I hope I've demonstrated some of the benefits that they give as an ecosystem service. Certainly in the UK, it's all about eating insects. So, um, and just really keeping those numbers in check, in balance with nature, which is what nature tends to do for itself. Um, and this is one of the reasons that they've been determined to be protected, as I say. Now, the pipistrelle bat is you know, found in an awful lot of places and it does like to roost in buildings, as do others as well. But these buildings are, are really quite rare. Um, in the in the numbers that they that we find them in overall, so that's again one of the um, it, it's really not that impactful generally at all. It doesn't stop developments; it can delay them sometimes. Um, so we have um, ecologists across the UK who are very much aware of the laws uh, pertaining to bats and will give guidance. They'll do the surveys, understand how bats are using a site that's up for development make recommendations. If there are roosts on site, then they'll be able to mitigate for the loss of them as well in most instances and find a way to be able for that development to go ahead. It won't stop things in most cases. You know, there are reasons that it, it's a really nice balance overall when we get it right, because you, yes, we want to conserve bats, but we don't want to conserve bats at all costs necessarily you know we still need to develop we still need places to live we still need um, places to go and buy food and warehousing and transport and the rest of it so it's getting that balance right which is so critical and when it does work right it's, it's really really very important so the earlier anybody considering development gets involved and gets an ecologist on board planning department is going to ask for surveys anyway um, if planning is is needed in a lot of cases, is particularly if there's trees and habitat like water bodies around there. Um, certainly, Greater Manchester Ecology Unit is set up um, to and, and local uh, local planning departments within the boroughs of Greater Manchester are certainly set up to be able to identify these sites and say, you need to look at protected species, you need to look at bats, you might need to look at newts, whatever badgers, whatever it might be. So um, yeah, really, but the, the, the sooner that people get involved in getting those surveys done the better the easier it is you can then build the protected species into the development so there's no real impact um, the other side of it is sometimes um, you see some horror stories in headlines about the cost of these things what they don't tell you is the cost of the actual development so it might cost i don't know um, x number of pounds to, to build a, a new barn for some bats say say five thousand pounds i don't know i'm guessing I, I don't know what the figures are i'm not a bat ecologist I work for a bank during the day, very different job. Um, so um, let's say it costs 5,000 for that, but there's going to be a whole new housing estate that's built next to it, which is going to make rake in hundreds of thousands of pounds for the developer, maybe even millions. It's a drop in the ocean, it's tiny. Yeah. yeah. And some of these costs might already be factored into the project, depending on what it is. You expect to come up against barriers. And I know in big companies, big construction companies, they kind of put some insurance in their costs to yeah. cover things like this. And a lot of them have their own ecologists now as well. Yeah. So they can do that work up front, which, you know, makes a, a lot of sense in some instances, you know, it's, uh, it, it, find out straight away. It's only good, prevent the delays. Delays do cost money in development. So prevent it, get in early and prepare for it, plan for it, it's much better. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is a second part to Hannah's question, which I'll oh, come sorry. back to, but just there is a, <laughs> something that links in from an anonymous attendee 
Um, could you describe their underground roosts a bit more, please? In planning, bat protection seems to focus on buildings, but for every new development, the ground is excavated and levelled. Should this be a concern for potential destruction of underground roosts? Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, you do get them used in places like tunnels and culverts and the like. So, um, but um, often I think, and my, as I say, I'm not an ecologist, so I'm not involved in planning in a great deal. I, I do deal with it occasionally. So I don't know the full ins and outs of how that would be dealt with. But basically any place that a bat roosts should be taken into, into account. And if an ecologist is um, asked to do a survey on a site, they will assess pretty much the entire site that they've got access to. Uh, obviously, sometimes things can be found during the work, which is uh, not ideal, but you can't plan for those things. Um, but um, I know of a, 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 a development fairly near me, actually, where we've had some um, people locally who've been, who've been in contact because they have some concerns about it, where there are at some underground sites and cellars and things which have been excavated out. And yes, I do know that the, uh, the planning department in that instance did have to build surveys to be carried out on those. In fact, there's a little bridge very nearby where I've uh, been recording hibernating bats um, for a number of years um, <coughs> using that bridge, it's under a, over a small stream. So, um, uh, so yeah, they, they, they do take, get taken into account, but if, if people are aware of a local development that might impact on some of the ground sites, then that's important to point out to your planning department. Don't always assume as well that um, planning departments know what's there. Local people know what's there because they see it all the time. I get lots of people get in contact and, and tell us that I've seen bats. Okay, well, get in touch with the bat group, report them for a start. We need to know about them. Then they're in our records. You can give us the locality. But also, if there is a development and do get in touch with the local planning department, say you've seen bats, say that there are features, if there are features in buildings and trees that bats could use, you know, like uh, holes, cracks, um, um, lifted bark on trees for example um, and you know tell them that there might be features on site if that's the case and they will then insist that that surveys are carried out as part of that planning application so you can protect sites that way um, very useful for local people to do that that's good to <laughs> thank you um, just back to the second part of hannah's question i see a lot of bats flying past my car Am I likely to hit a bat when driving or will their echolocation help them to avoid colliding with my car? Yeah, so bats and roads, it's a big, it's potentially a big issue. And we do know that um, that um, they will cross that traffic level. Um, all sorts of roads, this is including major roads as well. Um, and some flight lines, there's been some attempts at mitigation uh, that I've just been talking about to try and um, to reduce impacts. Uh, often a lot of the things that we've, that have been put in place don't work though unfortunately so we're, we're trying new new things now or um, colleges are recommending new things to to try and prevent impact it's possible um every year we will get the odd um bat that comes in that's been hit by transport uh, we even had one at brown longyear bat that was found on the front of one of the metrolink uh, trams in, in the center of manchester um a couple of years ago um so um, we'll get we'll occasionally get them that have been found in grills of um, cars, you know, radius grills or lorries um, occasionally. Um, it's not very often, but occasionally it does turn up. Um, are you liable to hit one? Possibly, possibly, but you can't predict. The only thing that you can do is to, um, is to try and uh, sort of, well, rescue it from there. To rescue a bat, I will mention how to do this. It's really, really quite important as well. Uh, so it might be worth carrying around a box in your car, maybe for this eventuality. Although you can use any sort of container. I've even, when I've run out of boxes <laughs> in the old days, I've even had to remove a sock and contain a bat in the sock. I felt quite sorry for it, to be fair. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I have nothing else to put it in one night. It was just a particularly busy night. Uh, anyway. Um, the, That's um, very resourceful. <laughs> you have to think like that sometimes. Yeah. I just I only had room for one more on that basis, but uh, well. I was going to struggle if we had another couple that night. But anyway. Um, but you know, it's worthwhile having sort of all we what we ask people to do is if they find a bat on the ground is to ideally wear, wear gloves. Um, it, the, there is something that some bats can carry a nasty disease which can be passed on to humans, which is rabies. It's incredibly rare, incredibly rare. Okay, the people at risk are people like me, and we're vaccinated against it. Um, um, but the best way of avoiding it is by not handling it directly. 
So we ask people to contain it. That might be a case of putting a box over it on the ground and just putting a stone on top of the box to contain. That's fine, okay? It just means it's safe. Nothing's going to get to it. Or alternatively, ideally, really, wear gloves, soft, get a soft cloth, piece of kitchen towel even, scoop it up, put the cloth in the back into the box, put the lid on, give us a call or your local bat group. Uh, even again, there's a national bat helpline, again, the Bat Conservation Trust. Ring them, they will put you in touch with your local carer. There's a network of carers across the entire UK. Okay, I think there was somebody from Italy. I know there's carers in Italy. They're mm. a, a rehab group on Facebook. So, uh, um, so there's there's organisations that are around well around the globe that, that that do rescue. That conservation trust are busy. <laughs> they are busy people. Uh, Jeff has said, do they hibernate right through, or will they wake up? Yeah, so they do definitely wake up. So they, and, and actually they, they don't wake up. I should say that. It's not sleep. It's hibernation. It's very different. So they actually rouse themselves out of hibernation to be able to go to sleep even. Okay, because it's not very restful. They're actually awake when they do it. Um, so it's like, um, it's a torpid state. So they go into torpor. They, they reduce their body temperature right down and their activity levels. They breathe, you know, very... Um, a few times a minute and their heartbeat is very slow compared to what it would normally be in flight. Um, and um, we don't know the full reasons why they rouse out of hibernation, but we do know that one of the reasons is probably to certainly to drink. If we get some mild weather, then they'll come out and feed because why not top up your reserves while you've got the opportunity to. Um, and potentially we think it might be to do with the immune system as well because um, the blood's not really moving very much. It's not getting the blood in the sort of the the immune cells around their system um, so of course they're a little bit more prone to potentially more prone to disease and uh, infection when they're um, uh, when they're in hibernation so we think just by getting the body going and, and rousing themselves out of hibernation is, a, is, is one of the reasons or one of the benefits of doing that yeah but the main thing main reason I think is because they they need to drink and this is another reason that they hibernate in relatively humid areas because they're so small they can't carry vast reserves of water but also because they're small, they have a large body surface area compared to their size, so they respire and they lose a lot of water very, and moisture very quickly. So again, I think that's probably one of the most likely reasons. Okay, do you think that's a common misconception that it's asleep and not sort of a dormant yeah. state? It's actually, it's actually one of my pet hates. It's, I see so many people talking about bat sleeping through the winter and I'm, and I'm, <laughs> I'm a bit of a pedant at times. I like to think of it as accurate rather than ped pedantic, but, um, <laughs> but they don't sleep. It's not sleeping. I think we'd all like to sleep through winter if we could. Yeah. Especially this one. <laughs> Most of this year, maybe. But yeah. This is it, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Jeff has also said, are there any available gadgets to listen to them or record them? Yeah, definitely. So the bat detector. So this is a bat detector. Um, it's um, so it's actually an ultrasound detector. I don't know if you could hear that when I was rubbing my fingers there next Not to it. Not very clearly. No. Some, sometimes the microphones aren't great on the, the laptops. But basically, they're very. You can. This is a bit more of a high tech one. It's just one I had close to my computer because I, I forgot to repair it earlier. So, but you have them. There's. Um, you can go to. Um, again, you can find wildlife equipment online. Um, lots of places sell bat detectors. I'm not going to um, recommend one site over another. You can spend anything from around about 50 to 60 pounds right the way up to a couple of thousand uh, on a bat detector. So this one's around about 300, but um, I've had this for a good few years now. Um, but, I, but to be fair, even the, the really sort of cheap ones, 60 to 100 pounds, you can, they're, they're perfectly adequate. Um, I use them for bat walks, not so much this year, unfortunately, but that's mm -hmm. what we have fought them for. Um, and they're, they're, fanta they're fantastic to use. Uh, there's lots of, again, online resources that you can uh, tap into as well and do your own surveys and find what, what's around. Um, a few years ago, there was a really cheap one that was being sold um, um, called the Discovery Bat. It was around about 25 quid, but they've stopped making it now unfortunately because it was it was great i bought one for my niece and nephew were quite young at the time it's the sort of thing where if they dropped it, it doesn't matter whereas you know some of the prices i've just mentioned it starts to matter a bit you know when it yeah. gets down yeah. but uh, there's some the, the magenta ones i think they're really really accessible uh, the one thing i do recommend if people are interested in getting one is try and get one with a digital dial um it lights up you can see what it's what the displays are as well um and the other thing is every summer um 
then I tend to do a back detector workshop, which tells people how you can use your back detector and get the most out of it. Uh, and again, the BCT run a number of courses. I do mine through the BCT, but I primarily try and do it locally for local people. So if you're a member of my, you know, Southlands back group, rather, not my back group, one I'm a member of, then um, then you will also, you get invited to that automatically. It's usually sort of May, June, at the beginning of the active season. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Wendy has a photo of a bat that she found in a house loft a while ago. Is there anyone to send it to, to ID? Is it the Bat Conservation Trust again? Um, you can send it to, to South Lanks, to me, if you like. Um, my The email address is on our website. Um, let me, I can type it in as well, into the chat. Thank you. Sorry, nearly there. So it's inquiry at slbg.org.uk, SLBG Southlands Bag Group, of course. Okay. I don't know if that's just going to all panellists, so I'm just going to put it to attendees. Yeah, it says all pan. Oh, it says all panellists, sorry, yeah, so. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, I didn't notice that. Oh, that's okay. Fab, and then someone will Watch work their bat magic and. Yep. Feel free, I'm more than happy to give it a go. Can't promise, depends on the photo. So. <laughs> yeah, depends on the quality. Uh, Jody asks, how long have bats been on Earth? That's 50 million years. Someone else has already answered that question. At least, probably longer, but we know in the present form in 50 million years, yeah. That we uh, know of, yeah. Uh, Nathan, how long can bats live? Yeah, well, the oldest one is 41 years old. Um, we know of one of the most studied roosts or colonies rather in the UK, well in the world actually, not just the UK, is down in Gloucestershire, a place called Woodchester Mansion. It's worth a visit if anyone's ever down that way. Brilliant. It's an old old mansion house, really great um, um, uh, country house, lo lots of really nice habitat locally. And the colonies there have been studied for I think it's 55 years now by um, uh, um, uh, a chap called Roger Ransom who's written, he's found out so much knowledge about the hawk, great horseshoe bats in particular. He'll commonly find bats that live in, it's only into their 20s and even into their 30s as, as well. So not unusual. Gosh, because you think, well, this yeah. is just something that I think, the smaller the animal, the shorter the lifespan, like a mouse will live a couple of years. That's absolutely correct, so, yeah. So I would have never thought that a bat would have a lifespan longer than maybe yeah. five. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And there's a lot of interest in it from a scientific basis to how, how do they manage to live so long? Um, because obviously um, prolonging life is something that, um, well, humans are quite interested in. So can we find out something? Can we learn something? Mm -hmm. What can we do? So it's a really fascinating area of study. Uh, in fact, actually, one of the leading places that's looking at that is in Belfast University. Oh, is, amazing. Uh, Fantastic. I'll ask you more about that later. Um, <laughs> Rosemary, how far do bats travel to feed? Yeah, well, again, they, 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 they're prepared to travel quite a long way. So some of the fruit bats will travel 100 kilometres, easy, um, even in the night. So, you know, quite, quite a long way. <laughs> That's not something that we're going to see in the UK, though. Um, but we know of bats in the UK that will travel up to 35 kilometres in a night. Um, uh, I've radio tracked one that was flying. Um, it was flying around about. I think it was about eight or nine kilometers from its roost, seemed to be flying from, from its roost, flying over to this site, feeding for a bit, and then going back to the roost, and then going to a different place and feeding for a bit. And, and then it would go back to the original one. That it had at. We don't know why they do that necessarily, but um, there's obviously a reason there must be good feeding. Um, but often they'll feed relatively close to the, the roost where they are using at that time. One of the reasons that some bats will move roost, of course. So some species are highly dependent on woodland, as I mentioned earlier. So, um, and particularly oak woodland, so the best times that roost in certain woodlands will usually just remain in that woodland. Same with some of the barber cells, or the barbs are one of the bats that can travel a long way. And that was the jet black bat with the golden tip fur that I mentioned earlier. Um, so, you know, it does vary again quite a lot depending on the species. So we talk about, we often talk about bats as a whole, but, you know, with 1400 species there, they're going to behave very differently on that one. So, yeah. Um, but most uh, the pipistrelle bats that we see is usually within a few kilometres of their roost. Um, but, uh, yeah, I see some quite regularly near me. And there's a the roost where they, I, I've never found the roost actually. I should, I keep trying to find it every <laughs> summer. 
Uh, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a keen runner and often in the summer I'll finish do some stretching after my runs in the summer and I'll see these bats flying over my head and I know they're always coming from across the street from between the houses and they're always heading in the direction of uh, sort of some fields and, and, and the local cemetery. Um, just uh, just the other side of um, uh, sort of a couple of hundred metres away from my house. So, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Next summer, that's your task. Yeah, I said that this summer, it didn't quite work. Every year. <laughs> we, we found some other stuff near the house this year, which was fascinating even more so. so yeah. oh. anyway. uh, that's the last question we've had. Anything else? Mm. Um, are people welcome to send their questions to the email we've just put in the chat? Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Mystery. Yeah. Mystery uh, session time. Okay, so this is a bonus. So um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a moment because what you might want to do, um, sorry about the first bit, I'm going to suggest that you might want to pin my picture to the screen if that's possible because not for me, not for me, I'm sure nobody really wants to look at this face for any longer. Um, but more importantly, I rescue bats, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this year I've rescued just short 200 bats and the bat group just short 300, I think it is. Um, yeah, 299 we've well, we will have had by the end of this evening. So I have bats which will go back to the wild, which is ultimately our aim. But I also have bats that don't survive, uh, and they didn't. But I then have these bats that we thought, well, there's a chance here that they might survive. So we go to a chance, and they have survived, but unfortunately, they're not able to go back to the wild because they've not been able to do well enough. So they might not, they might have slightly damaged wings, for example. In fact, Frankie, my nocturnal bat, has got just one wing, and he's a he's what we call a, a lifer or a long-term captive. He stays with me. Um, he's an ambassador for bats, and I keep him so that we can do things like again, I've got a license to keep him because they're a protected species. He's certainly not a pet. Um, and he's his job is to well, show people how wonderful bats are, which I hope you're all going to agree when you see him. So I've got two bats to show you this evening. I've got the biggest British species, which is a nocturnal, Frankie, as I've just mentioned, but also I've got a common pipistrelle to show you as well. Um, and this is another one, which is a long-term captive. And this one just, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with him, but he just won't fly very well. He doesn't seem to be, a doesn't seem to be interested in it. And when he does manage to fly, then he's not very good at it. So he would never survive in the wild. So. I only have a couple of choices, which is either to, well, put them to sleep, which I'm not that keen to do, or these behave as ambassadors for bats. Normally, most summers, I'll do a lot of bat walks and I'll take them on those so people can meet them. We do shows, so we go to um, country events like um, um, all sorts of things, um, um, you know, where we have a stall, information stall and gift stall, and we can take the bats and they're a big hit. Um, and you know, people get to see them that way. So um, it, it, it's a, a good, um, a good way of seeing them up close and seeing what they really like. Anyway, I already mentioned before when we handle off glove bats, we have to wear gloves, so I'll be doing that. But also, there's a, there is a chance that um, uh, there is a risk at the moment that um, we don't really understand this, but we do know that uh, there are similarities between the two types of uh, coronavirus, um, the one that we've got and the one that's been isolated in bats. We there is a, always a risk that we are carrying it. Um, and in which case we don't want to be able to pass it to bats. Now, although these are long-term captives, I try to maintain good hygiene um, with all of my bats. So I'll change my gloves between each one and I'll probably change my mask as well. Probably don't need to do that. Um, but, but we tend to just to basically keep everything completely hygienic and separate for them. Okay. Um, and as I say, we don't know if we can pass it on to them. So we always wear uh, a mask when we're rescuing them and the like just simply because we have to come into contact with them this way and we don't it could be we see the impact that white nose syndrome has caused to american bats we don't want something similar in the uk uh, we don't know whether it will but let's prevent it if it could okay so of course i'm hoping that everyone will be able to see this okay so this is frankie this is a nocturnal bat i'll just turn him so you can see him there <laughs> Okay, he's just waking himself up. He has been in torpor because the room I normally keep him in is relatively cool. It's not, not particularly heated. I've not had the heating on today because it's been quite warm anyway. Um, he is a fully grown adult bat. The reason he's called Frankie, he's only got one wing. You can see the wing there folded up against his side. On the other side, it's, uh, it's missing. And of course, he would never survive in the wild just with one wing. It was so badly damaged. 
And in fact, when he came in, we thought we could save part of the wing, but ultimately that wasn't possible. Um, so by which time we got attached to him, he, I think he got attached to us as well. So um, well, I like to think he did. And he has got the right temperament for a bat to be able to show to people. So really perfect. Um, overall and a nice thing for people to meet. We call them a four finger bat because when you, you hold them across the palm of your hand like that, they cover just four fingers. So, um, or cover all the fingers really. He's looking a bit large as well. He must be, he's eaten all his mealworms from last night. So, which is what I feed them in captivity. Um, it's actually quite difficult to know what to feed the mealworms though as well. Mealworms aren't a natural food. So we have to get the right vitamins and minerals in, into him. Um, and particularly our long-term bat. So it's, it's you know, it takes, Quite some training to be able to care for that, um, but uh, we train new people every year. Okay, uh, it's called Frankie because he's only got four fingers, and uh, some of you might know about a film where there's a character called Frankie Four Fingers. So um, that's uh, <laughs> that's my best attempt. Other people have suggested things like Bandit because he's only got one arm, or Nelson for the same reason. So uh, I have had bats called Bandit and Nelson before, though, for that reason. Okay. So that's uh, that's the nocturnal bat, which, as I say, is the, the biggest British species. He's pretty lethargic, but that's not unusual, as I mentioned, because he's been in torpor today. So, um, yeah, but he's starting to he's starting to warm himself up. And if I held him onto him for another five or ten minutes or so, he would warm up. And they do purr as well that's when you right. stroke him, which is really rather nice. Okay, so that's that. One of the other things I'll just show you. I'll show you his wing. Um, now, I don't check his wings very often, but one of the reasons that I, I'm going to open his wing is to make sure that he's cleaning it properly, okay? Um, and I tend to do that, it's one of the first signs that there's a problem with them. So I tend to do that on things where people might be interested in seeing it, okay? So I'll try and get this in the right place. I just need to make sure I hold him in the right way. He's not particularly keen, but when we talked about wingspan before, that might give you some idea. Obviously, he's normally got two of them. His wings are quite, they're looking really quite nice and uh, nice and clean and everything. You might even be able to see through it. You can see my finger there just in that middle bit. You can see how thin they are. Okay, maybe a little bit dry. So I'll just increase this humidity a bit in his tank. Uh, in his cage rather so um, um after today but um but that's one of the reasons that we check them just to check that uh, they're, they're behaving okay and they're in good condition there he is. now if you see his mouth going a lot of people think that he's bearing his teeth and actually you see a lot of pictures of bats where they are bearing their teeth but what they're actually doing is echolocating they're shouting out this high-pitched sound they can't do that with their mouth shut. He's a, a bat that echolocates through his mouth, not his nose. So he has to open his mouth. And a human would interpret seeing the teeth as a sign of aggression. It's not aggression. They can't, they can't emit the sound unless they've got their mouth open. So, um, so a byproduct of that is that we see their teeth. Um, but he will chew up big moths and, um, and actually some beetles. So he'll crunch through some large beetles as well uh, when he's... Um, uh, when he's normally, well, when he'd normally be feeding in the wild. Okay, so that's our biggest British species. I'm going to swap now. Uh, this will take me a moment because it's a change of uh, masks and a change of gloves, so won't bear with me a moment. And okay. Another bat theme mask. Oh, sorry. Can't see. Okay, so this is a pipistrelle bat. Now, it might be um, a bit of a difficult one, this one, because they're quite small. They're only a, a two finger bat rather than a four finger bat. And um, they're also quite squeaky. So if he starts squeaking, he'll be nearer the microphone than I am. So you might hear him rather than me. So I might not say too much on this one because it might be a little bit broken up otherwise. I don't know if you can hear him squeaking now at all. No? Okay. Well, you might hear him a bit now. Oh, he's having a good look around. This bat is called Owen. Now, he doesn't like being exposed like this. They tend to be, oh, that's why he's wandering a little bit. So what I'll do instead is just hold him. Stay still. 
There we go. So I'll just hold him, stand up, and hold him in my hand like that. Be able to see his face. I don't know if you can see that okay. Whoops. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Hmm. These are these calls are not the echolocation calls, if you can hear them. These are what we call social calls. Although they're probably more antisocial calls, more of a case of put me down, get back in the cloth. Oh, those. Okay. Not that he'll be moaning at feeding time. And they also get extra mealworms when they get this, like a little bit of a when they, when they, when they, There we go. So tiny. Yeah. So again, you might just about be able to make out if I tip my hand, it's just on two fingers. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So as I say, they're two of the rescues. So what I didn't tell you, I'll come back in a moment, I'll just put him away. Sorry, he's a little bit more active than I'd like that one, really. So um, I don't want to um, disturb him for too long. Um, often he's fine, he's just maybe a little bit agitated tonight, I'm not sure why. Um, but um, what I didn't tell you is how many insects these things eat. So they feed on midges, they're little pipper straw bats. And I'm not sure how accurate this is, but there are some numbers that people have calculated to, to suggest how many insects they eat at night. But it's been suggested that that little thing will eat up to 3,000 midges a night. Wow. Which is really quite something. So, um, you know, if you imagine that you uh, a lot of colonies in the maternity roosts in Greater Manchester might have 100 individuals, that's a lot of bats, a lot of bats. That's a lot of midges that's going to get consumed every single night. So really quite something. That's amazing. <laughs> Guess to look at them. No, no. So, yeah. So how many rescues do you have at the minute in total? Um, right now I have 11 in care at the minute. I've got just the, two, those two as long-term captives at the moment. Uh, I've got six in that hopefully will be going back to the wild next year. They've been youngsters which didn't survive. Well, no, they did survive, obviously. <laughs> I've got that the wrong way around. Um, they, uh, uh, they survived, they've been hand-reared by members of our group and they went up to a flight cage that we have in Silverdale. We have to teach them how to fly, we have to teach them how to catch insects, how to roost, which uh, Gail up in uh, North Anx has been uh, doing for us. But it was a little bit late in the season when they arrived um, with her and she struggled to get them to be, well, she struggled to get them releasable um, just because of the temperatures and those sorts of things. It wasn't ideal for young rats. So I'm over wintering them and we're gonna try again in the spring. So. Uh, so hopefully that, that's a that's a group of six. They're just in. They're all together. They they live together in one big, big uh, cage. So they're pretty comfortable and dropping through loads of mealworms every night. Oh, amazing! That's an experience that not many people would get to have. Absolutely, yeah. It's 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 the thing that started my wife and I in um, that conservation, um, and I'm pleased to still be involved in that in some way or shape or form i think it's a fascinating thing and it's wonderful to do as well there's there's still every time we release one i've got two that i should hopefully be releasing soon just around the corner from me and when i release it's still it's still just as good as the first time that we released and it's just fantastic to watch them fly off and of course yeah. what we do is knock on the door of the people who found them we back where they were found and they love seeing them go because they you know they made a difference and it, and it really is important yeah yeah of course oh that's fantastic um Thank you so much, Steve. This has been brilliant. I know I've just seen a few comments in the chat that people have really enjoyed it. I, I hope I've not talked too long and bored people or what have you. And I know people have some that needed to leave early, but thank you very much. Oh, no, of course not. Is there anything else that you want to, to finish off with or add? Not really. Um, just to say thanks for listening. Um, I, I hope everyone's enjoyed it um, and uh, gained something by the, the talk tonight. And I say, um, I've mentioned some of those things that you can do um, yourself, so uh, feel free or just even tell people about how amazing bats are. That's just good enough for me. <laughs>